Welcome to the second of these Sunday sessions. It's seven o'clock in the evening here in London, where I'm actually sitting in the home of Elizabeth Oldfield, who will be one of the guests later in this season of Overheard Conversations. But tonight, we are reaching into the future. We're having a, a Sunday session that's also a Monday session with Michael in, in Christchurch, Hetero, New Zealand. Welcome, Michael. It's good to it's good to be with you. Kia ora, Dougald, and kia ora, everyone. Yes, it's a um, it's a chilly autumn morning here in Otatahi, which is the Maori word for Christchurch. Um, or name that's the original name for this land, um, before it was colonised. So, yeah, in Aotearoa. New Zealand. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, we uh, we made this journey to to London, uh, to the UK, a few days ago as a family, and it's in the northern hemisphere to travel southwards at this moment in the year. It's just the right moment to do it because you fast forward into spring, and so we're here, and things are blooming and unfurling. Um, and then we'll we'll return to to Sweden uh, and to the the bareness and the the chill, but the light is returning very fast up there as well. But it's good to be to be speaking across the across the threshold of the the days of evening and morning and of the seasons of spring and autumn and remembering how entwined our lives still are with these patterns of light and dark and warm mm. and cold because they're still at the heart of what what feeds us and that's really what we're what what we meet around michael mm. and there's a question that i've been thinking of asking everyone who steps into this space at the beginning of our conversations which is just tell us a little bit about home about um where you call home i'm glad you asked because <laughs> roy Mata food commons is my home um i'm joining this conversation from a house here in otatahi um it's a house it doesn't feel like home but I know when I walk onto the whenua, which is land, down at Roimata Food Commons, I know that I return home every time I arrive. So there's a deep sense of knowingness and relationship with that land. And I, and I felt that as soon as I walked onto it, it wasn't a relationship that has developed, or that was developed through the relationship of working with the land. It already existed. Mm. so there's a knowingness there that yeah the spirit of who i am has had some relationship with this land before mm. well maybe a good place for us to start would be to hear a bit more about Romata food commons and for you to give us more of a picture of that that land and the journey that you've been on with it since that that first arrival So I've done a lot of, um, yeah, I, I apologize in advance for all of the gardening puns that will be probably unintentional, but um, yeah. So I've done a lot of digging <laughs> into the history of the land um, that is the Roy Matafu Commons now. And it actually plays a, yeah, a remarkably kind of significant role in the history of, of our city of Otatahi. Um, it used to be swamp. So the name Roy Mata actually translates, well, the closest translation in English is to um, the word teardrop, mm. which relates to the wetness, the, the presence of water um, on the land. And actually most of Christchurch was a swamp when um, 
the English settlers arrived. It was attractive to the settlers because it was flat, and so building on it was deemed to be easier than you know, places that have hills. Um, so large parts of the city have been drained in order to to be usable land, um, well, at least in the way that they wanted to use them, and we use it now. Um, yeah. And then, actually, there were two English gentlemen that bought this piece of land after colonisation and turned it into a farm called Isis Farm. Um, mm. Isis being the Egyptian goddess of agriculture, but it also happened to be that these two gentlemen went to Oxford University together. And the river Isis runs through the university there. Um, and we've actually found classifieds, um, classified ads advertising wheat and barley and oats um, from the first ever newspaper that was published in New Zealand called the Littleton Times as far back as 1848, advertising bushels of wheat and oats for sale. Prior to it being a farm, it would have been used as a, a natural food source by local Māori tribes um, for fishing in the river, um, for the collection of birds, for protein, uh, the harvesting of timber, for building houses, or um, building canoes, waka. Um, so yeah, that for as long as the known history, there's been a relationship of, of provision, of sustenance, of this particular piece of land and the the community, the people who live in relationship with it. And so it feels now like what we're doing is just another iteration. It's the the current version of that's manifesting this relationship between people and sustenance. Yeah. So it's a six acre piece of land in the middle of the city, um, which is primarily its history as an industrial area. It's now a low socioeconomic sort of com residential community as well as industrial. Strangely, it's never had any buildings on this land. So it actually meets organic soil standards. So as far as, again, sustenance and the provision of food, that felt like an invitation to um, to really step into that role within our community to to provide nourishing sustenance for for the people or with the people I should say. So yeah, we've been we've been going now since two thousand seventeen. We've taken many liberties um, from the initial permission from our local council. Um, to grow food there. We now no longer ask for permission to do things. We just, and we don't apologize actually either. So <laughs> we just, yeah, we act with a sense of, I guess, knowingness that what we're doing is the right thing to be doing. I was going to ask you about the, the sense of agency that you know, you've actually just spoken about in one sense in the way that the coming onto the land, coming into relationship with the the council and and then, you know, feeling sufficiently grounded and with sufficient agency that you don't have to ask for permission for everything. But I'm I'm curious about you, Michael, and like what the what the journey was by which you found the agency to be you know, what they call in Swedish, there's this great phrase, the fire soul of a project. There are people who are fire souls. And I was saying to someone earlier, I said, I don't know quite like how it works and what mix of founders and people there is, but Michael must be like one of or the the fire soul of the, the Roy Marta project. But how did how did Michael become a person who finds themselves at the heart of something like this? I would say that the earthquakes awakened that within me. Um, so for those who may not be aware, Christchurch as a city went through the largest recorded seismic <laughs> period of activity ever recorded on this planet um, back in 2010, right through to actually we still get earthquakes today, but 
Yeah, there were over 10,000 earthquakes and aftershocks recorded within a few years here. Um, I lost my job that I had at the time. And I actually, wandering around the brokenness of our city is what awakened that within me. That I found that it was an invitation to step up, to start creating the future that we deserve. And having a 10 month old baby at the time of, of this, I guess, traumatic disruption in the way that we were living our lives at that time, I guess, just deepened that even further. And so I, I, I yeah, most of my work that I do is in service of the future that I'm trying to, I guess, steward for not only my children, but for all of the children that are alive and yet to be born. And there is uh, this relationship to the future in the work. One of the ways that that's come through in the things that I've heard you say recently is, you said this in a very matter of fact way in that, that beautiful short film that was made about the food commons. Uh, this is a nice to have now, but pretty soon it'll be a have to have. Um, and... I what I loved about that was it's a very simple observation but actually a lot of things fit inside it because uh, Gunnar Rundgren is a Swedish um, writer about food and land and agriculture who lives actually quite close to us in Uppsala County I read something from him recently where he was like, look, we have to be honest about the fact that the kind of farming we are going to need is not economically viable in the world we're in right now. That, you know, there is no straight way to make it work as a thing that you make a living from in ordinary economic reality today. And my sort of, my read onto that is, yeah, uh, and, and, you know, important not to try and hide that behind uh, sort of things that are actually being subsidized by people's uh, other activities and profiles and so on. But equally, that that means that what's called for just now is some kind of trickster spirit that is able to make something that shouldn't work, work. And often that has something to do with the nice to have. So a lot of the ways in which the kinds of activities by which it seems plausible that we'll be able to feed ourselves in the kinds of futures we're likely to be headed in, a lot of the ways they're kept alive just now are you know, nice to have in the sense that they're kind of luxury production as opposed to you know, the, the mainstream economically uh, viable core forms of agriculture, or they're hobbies and therefore a matter of people having the time and the energy over and the access to land and so on in their lives to be able to be involved in things and you know I'm involved in things like that and I think that they matter and are part of the story of what's called for but your your description of what you're doing in those terms allowed me to put those examples alongside something which has a different feel to it partly because it's invoking the histories of the commons, partly because, you know, you speak very clearly about the importance of making good food available to everyone. And when we spoke the other week, you said something about, you know, not wanting anyone to feel shame about their ability to feed their, their family. And I wonder if you could, you know, take us more into that and into how central that is to what you're doing and why. Yeah, it's funny because um, the film took a, a wee while to emerge <laughs> and that was recorded, that piece was probably recorded two years ago. And I think in a lot of ways, we've already reached that point where it's a have to have. That's how quickly things have started to move within our communities. But yeah, I mean, we're we're kind of blessed here in in this city that you know we have forty three community gardens, but most of them work on this kind of, I guess, old school socialist kind of sweat equity 
basis um, where if you have time and energy to input into the community garden, then the reward is that you have access to the food that is produced but you know in the relationship with you and the land. And when you start to sort of geographically map these these spaces, you realize that they're all in the nice, comfortable sort of middle class suburbs where people do have the time and capacity to go and spend time practicing convivial labor um, and having access to to these sources localized sources of food. But what we find in in areas like Wollstone, in Roimata is that people don't have the time and the energy. We've reached a point in human history where the working poor is a reality, and it's become, become a much, much greater percentage of the populations with, that exist within our communities than, than it already does. So to so to find the the time to yeah partake in these kind of hobbyist activities is a, is a luxury and with the cost of living crisis what we're noticing is that access to food just in general is marginalized so people prioritize housing over food there's a lot more shame attached to not having a roof over your head than there is not being able to put food on the table but it comes a close second. And so, and we often find in communities that the people who need help the most are not the ones asking for it or using the official channels in order to access the resources that may buffer their situation slightly. And so we wanted to create a space that was an open, a continuously open invitation to access what people need. And that's where the use of public land, I guess, aligns so nicely. Because there are no gates. There's no, you know, there's no way for us to close the space off. It is open 24-7 every day of the year. And so if, if a family that is struggling to put food on the table and struggling with the, the shame of, of not being able to eat good food or eat any food, needs to come and pick apples at 10 o'clock on a Friday night when they know that there's no one in the park, then I absolutely celebrate the fact that they do that. And on the one hand, you've been um, developing the, the food growing that you're doing on site, and you've also been working with local food producers and getting because you built this structure in the middle of the, the site that's based on something that would exist within a Maori um, settlement as a food store, as I understand it. Can you tell us a bit about that side of the work that you've been doing? Yeah, so I guess food rescue, you know, food waste is a, is a global conversation um, for many different reasons. The amount of land that is used to produce food, the amount of water that is fresh water that is used to produce food, um, and the amount of, I guess, uh, the number of people struggling to, to access food has almost created a whole industry or sector around food rescue, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I know some people that run local organic farms and generally after their farmers markets, they would take anything back that couldn't be stored for 24 hours and still be of sufficient standard. They would just take it back to the, farm and compost it and I mean that's again that's not a terrible way of utilizing the food it, it only is terrible when you know that there's people in your community who can't get access to food so yeah so I on a Sunday morning would go along to the to the local market and just pick up whatever they had left and put it on on our pataka kai so in a Maori pa or Maori village settlement um, there would be a a structure that was raised up off the ground and that's where the food was stored and that would mean that the rats or or any vermin you know would find it much harder to 
to spoil the food. And so, yeah, I guess other names for a patakakai might be a community pantry. That might be a term that's more familiar to people. And so, yeah, we would just make this this really healthy, nourishing food available for the community to come and access on a weekly basis. However, we've found, or well, I've found, <laughs> as things have gotten harder in the community, that the spirit that's held at that time in that space has become much harder for me to hold as well, that there was a developing sense of entitlement. Um, and almost a recognition that, yeah, maybe we're actually almost enabling people to not seek the agency to, to, to nourish themselves or sustain themselves in relationship with the people in their family or their greater family or their community. We don't want to hold people where they are. We want to build people up. You know, it's a hand up, not a hand out. So we haven't actually been doing it for a while because we need to reconfigure it to make sure that it's serving the intention of of why it was offered in the first place, which is not just about reducing food waste. It's about nourishing our community on as many levels as we can. Hmm. I'm struck talking to different people who are involved in, you know, on the ground and in practice in different parts of the world around these kind of questions about how we change our relationship to food and land and how, um, how, how we feed our communities in ways that aren't, you know, held hostage by the market, let's say, or held hostage by the the inhuman side of the logic of the state either, that there's a whole tangle of things that come up. So on the one hand, while you were speaking, I was thinking of Bentley Urban Farm in one of the former coal mining communities on the edge of Doncaster, which I wrote about briefly in At Work in the Ruins, which a friend of mine, Warren Draper, is sort of one of the, I guess, fire souls of, uh, of Bentley and, I, I remember him writing something during the pandemic where he was like, you know, we found ourselves feeding four times as many families as the council run food bank. And he said, it's because, you know, it's partly because we can, but it's also because there are people who are hungry, who are frightened of going to the council run food bank, because the way that it's set up means that uh, there is kind of documentation of need and circumstances. And he said, you know, there are families who are frightened their kids are going to be taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And we're able to make food available to them without that fear being mm -hmm. attached to it. And, and I also think, you know, a, a different set of conversations with Adam Wilson at the peasantry school and, in upstate New York, where he's part of this farm where they, I don't think this is quite the language he uses for it, but it's the language that comes to me whenever I speak about it. They are under a vow that all of the food that is grown and produced on that farm will feed people without being sold for money. Mm. Doesn't mean that they don't need any money in the way that they run the farm, but it means you know, apart from anything else, that it's called for a real attention and work. And this is what I was thinking of as you were speaking then about, you know, the stage you were at with the kind of the working out of the right way to make food available to people. You know, I notice a lot of attention in Adam's work over time to the language, the ways in which invitations are made. And one of the things that he'll always say is, you know, this food is given to anyone who is hungry for any reason. Yeah. And what I love about that is it doesn't divide the world into a category of 
the needy and then the category of the rest of us who are doing okay. It mm. actually invites everyone to acknowledge the common experience. It's like the other example that's coming to mind is Pam Warhurst, who is you know the fire soul behind the incredible edible Todmorden and uh, her slogan for that project, which I love. You know how funders always ask you to kind of specify who is your project for? <laughs> uh, and the slogan is, if you eat, you're in. Mm. So if you belong to that particular category of human being, <laughs> and you get through the day without needing to eat at least once or twice, then uh, carry on about your business. But otherwise, you have a stake in this. Um, and I feel like actually, you know, the the wrangling, the wrestling, the culture work of how we describe this, how we think and feel it, how we talk about it with each other, how we make these invitations and the consequences they have is really tightly bound up with the kind of the practical food growing and the practical, you know, reimagining of um, community economies. And uh, just to, to hear you all, to hear you reflecting on the complexities around that part of what you've been doing reminds me of that again. Yeah, I think the the lack of relational human activity is a is a huge barrier to I guess some sense of moving forward on the journey that that is not measured in miles. That's measured in wholeness. Hmm. And so this whole idea of economy and how it's been financialized um, is kind of one of the underlying currents that that I feel pull us down or keep us keep us down. And I guess it's why the whole concept and the construct of commons and commoning just feels so right to me is that everything is relational. You know, the value is in the space between us. Yes. And I think of Illich's short text, Silence is a Commons, and the way that he describes the historical commons in England in that, and it's significant that that text was, it was a talk given in Japan. So he is engaging in the kind of intercultural work, the translation of specific examples that have things that are like them, but distinctive in their own way, as we move or speak across distance and between um, places and histories and, and cultures. But he, he talks about um, the commons, not in the way that some thinkers and writers and practitioners have done as, you know, a way of managing resources. He says, you know, the commons is that part of the land which is not available for the production of resources, but for people's ability to meet their own needs and each other's needs. And he says, you know, the law of the commons was an unwritten law um both because people did not care to write it down in other words there was no need for it to be written down and because it embodied a reality too complex to fit into paragraphs the weave of relations in the historical commons the weave of agreements and the ways in which those were worked out revisited reimagined over time through the political work that is always part of holding a commons there's always a work of decision making together in the um the the organizing of common land and common common food growing i'm curious as well about this relationship with the local council i love the you know there's, there's a sort of nice twist in the story like you say in the in the in the video you go yeah like we asked the council for we, we we asked the council and they gave us permission to plant 30 trees so we planted 65 and now there's 140 or whatever it was and you said this before that it's kind of 
you know, we don't really ask for permission anymore. And again, I think of Pam Warhurst from Incredible Edible saying, yeah, we didn't ask the council for permission when we started planting in all of these places around the town because because they'd have said no and that would have made them feel bad and we don't want to make people feel bad and anyway what are we doing we're just yes. bringing life and beauty and food into bits of land that were unloved around our town but i'm i like the sort of the the middle ground the tricksterishness of yeah like we we're not going to just be these gorillas over here who don't want to talk to the council but we're also not going to just be these kind of well behaved, doing it exactly how they say. How's that relationship going on over time? It's interesting actually talking to people who work within the council now. It's hard not to see, well, for me, that their relationship with land and public space has actually developed over the last seven years. There's elements of what we have done with our project that are now starting to emerge in other parts of the city. So um, one of the things that's happened over the last couple of years is that, yeah, they're looking at spaces within public parks that can play host to wildflower meadows, you know, and they did one to start off with. And then the communities were like, oh my God, this is so amazing. You know, we want it in our park. Um, and so we're starting to see, you know, a council version of wildness starting to become more acceptable. Um, there's still that element of control in the relationship between council and land, um, but they've come a long way. So uh, yeah, yeah, I um, <laughs> I hold a relationship with all of this stuff, sort of there's a deep humility in, in, in how I tried to hold myself in this. Um, but I'm quietly stoked that I think we're leading the council um, to reimagine what stewardship of these spaces actually looks like in a way that can be nourishing in many ways. So you mentioned before about, you know, that this food is available for people who are hungry well, I think there's there's hunger for more than just food in our communities. There's hunger for connection and a sense of belonging. Um, there's a hunger to feel grounded. You know, when I walk around cities, primarily Christchurch, because I don't really go anywhere, <laughs> um, the urban environment feels very jagged and uncomfortable doesn't feel like home at all but also it doesn't the ground doesn't feel firm in those spaces it feels temporary that landscape feels temporary it, it's a there's no there's no roots. Mm. You know, and when you plant an apple tree that can live for 250 years, that's a commitment to a future that is much more nourished than many other things that we can be doing. We've also added alongside... Um, well, not directly in terms of spatially alongside, but in the park, we've also planted quite a few native trees and shrubs along the banks of the Apawaho Awa, the Heathcote River. And some of those trees that we've planted, um, the native New Zealand kahikatea, which is a white pine, they can live for over a thousand years. And so when you plant something like that yeah there's just something in that about putting down roots that will create strength for generations of people yet to be imagined and it feels like if humanity is going to to make it through 
this period of disruption that feels really visceral at the moment. And it's going to feel a lot more challenging in the years to come. Putting down roots, I feel, is a is a damn good strategy to try and make our way through that. Mm. I love the the image of sort of rewilding local government and the the yeah. sense of infecting um, the culture of the council through this, you know, the kind of permeable membrane between uh, the commons and the um, you know the public um, that you've been tending through this and it was reminding me I was back in West Norwood which is an area of South London that I was heavily involved with in the years when I was living in London um, because I was part of creating a community owned and run street market there mm -hmm. and I remember at one of the early meetings that we were having for this the West Norwood feast it's called it's still going there was uh, a couple of council officers who we were working with who were really the people who were hands-on from the council side in this project. And one of them said to me, oh, we always think you have to drag people to get them along to meetings. And you've got all these people here and they look really happy to be here. And I remember thinking afterwards, ah, it's a bit like, you know, if you go up to someone and grab them and try and drag them, well, you, they're going to dig their heels in. But somehow, you know, the dominant systems on both the market and the state side of the line within modern societies have lost the arts of invitation when you don't have the power of money or the power of sort of legislative authority, et cetera, um, by which people come together and do things. And so there's a relearning the art of invitation, um, you know, which as I'm thinking now about like the the way that you followed that thread and it deepened into the trees and the the roots and the two hundred and fifty and thousand year time horizons. It's like you know, the living world, the modern human world, can't rely on the kinds of logics for getting things done that the market and the state rely on, and therefore, simply an attention to and involvement with it is is one of the places, one of the directions from which we can learn that there are other possibilities for you know mutual involvement than the than the rather crude implements of of modernity and i guess i i've got one more sort of question before we open well before we say goodbye to the people who are watching the public recording and we open this up to those of you who are with us live for for questions because at at the end of the at the end of the film you speak about uh, you know, how you want to be in service to anyone who is wanting to and trying to create things like this, whatever they look like in different places around the world. And I'm curious about both about whatever responses you've had so far since the film was released, but also whether there's any words that you'd want to share with us generally as a group of people who have kind of gathered together um, today to, to talk about these things like any word seeds that you would sow with people who are a feeling or that maybe trying to do things along the same lines or maybe who feel well i couldn't do what michael's done um <laughs> yeah, absolutely can <laughs> um yeah so I'm, I'm actually getting more interest i guess in that in, in terms of my invitation from from places around the world that are not Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, so the UK, there's there's definitely some interest there. Um, and I've just had some been swapping some emails with someone in Canada in the last few days. Um, even in the YouTube comments, people from across the from across the United States are sort of hinting towards they're looking at the the their geographic sort of spaces that they're living in and they're they're starting to open themselves up to the commons way of viewing the world which is seeking the abundance that already exists rather than this kind of scarcity mindset that we generally work in and sort of view the world on a day-to-day -day basis through the market sort of lens and so people are making comments like you know we have an abundance of land here 
and we have a community that is struggling to sustain themselves. So they're now starting to see the opportunity that exists in stepping into that relationship with land. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, the reason we're here is because of sunlight and soil. Mm. That's the magic, that's the wonder, that's the awe of the relationship between people and land is that, you know, we wouldn't be here without this magic. So. So honor it and cherish it. It's there every second of every day that we breathe. Thank you, Michael. And thanks everyone who's been been watching along with this so far. And we're going to say goodbye to those of you who are watching on on YouTube. Um, and we're going to open up for those of you who are here to, uh, yeah, to bring your questions.